The cartoon strip Super Strikers was first published in South Africa in the year 2000. By 2014, it had become a well-known brand on many parts of the continent, and it's continued to evolve. This is tonight. I'm Bruce Whitfield, and for Viral Friday, I'm joined by Richard Morgan Grenfell, Managing Director of Striker Entertainment, to talk about the soccer-themed comic that has taken the continent by storm. Are you a soccer fan? Um, Have you I've, ever kicked a ball in your life? I've kicked a ball very badly, but I, I'm not. But luckily we've got a lot of fans in our office in Cape Town. So I just kind of nod and politely smile and say things about people who I think are in the soccer world and that gets me by. Okay, good. <laughs> so where does this start? I mean, the year 2000, it's a long time ago. It starts in the form of a, a Peanuts tile uh, cartoon strip. So, so we started actually with a, with a multi-page. We actually started with an idea. And the idea was, wouldn't it be cool if we could create heroes for young South Africans that they could really relate to? You know, not the... Batman, Superman, Rubble Bobby, that sort of stuff. Trying, to, trying yeah. to get away from guys who wear their underpants on the wrong side of their pants and do something that a young boy in South Africa can, can really aspire to be. And so we thought, well, it's got to be football because everyone loves football and it's, it's attainable and we'll create the world's best football club and, and the kids will love it. And then we thought, well, how do we, how do we make this commercially viable? We said, well, we, we sell advertising like every other magazine that we, that we see. And then we thought, well, we heard, listen, it's a tough market out there selling advertising. Come up with an angle. And the angle was, well, let's do product placement. We need sponsors like any good football team. We need a mobile sponsor. We need a beverage sponsor. We need a kit sponsor. And how long did it take to get to that point where sponsors were prepared to come on board? Because with a new concept, it's untried, it's untested. You're going to market. It's a nice concept. It's a good theme. You've got to get your distribution right, all of that sort of stuff. But sponsors want proof of concept before they start throwing money at you for putting a Caltex logo on a, a football shirt. That's right. exactly what they said to us. So we thought, okay, we need to, we need to have readership and circulation from day one and it needs to be substantial. And then we came across the idea of let's piggyback and let's insert it into an existing newspaper. And, and that meant that we had consumption, mass consumption from day one. We knocked on every door, you know, every door that you can think of, every marketing budget in the whole of the country. And I think we were just about to give up. A lot of people said, hey, awesome idea, love it. Unfortunately, budgets are, are all done for the year. You know, it's great, but it's not right for our, our product. Ah, uh, you know, maybe come back next year. And I think just as we were about to throw in the towel, Caltex at the time said, okay, we, we're interested, Let, let's do this. So we were, and we were fortunate in that from issue one, we always had the sponsor that could float the boat. And so, so it took you from issue one, you had the sponsor. So mm. they were happy with your distribution. How did you distribute? So originally we went out in the city press. And then, and then the sponsors wanted uh, even more reach. So we moved across to the Sunday Times. And then in 2012, I think, we made a, another move, and that was to, uh, to go into family magazines. So today we distribute with you, Drum and Hayskinet. And that gets us 600,000 copies out every month. Which uh, the, the extraordinary reach of yeah. that stable of magazines yeah. into households, into a demographic that advertisers, mass market advertisers mm. want to reach is nothing short of extraordinary. But you've also then gone out of print and into the challenging world of digital. Let's just take a look at this, how Super Strikers has transformed from the print publication, from the Tintin style magazine publication, into digital. Take a look at this. <laughs> All right, guys, this is it. The moment we've been fighting for all season. Let's get our name on that trophy. Hey, Duma, this is all Shakespeare. He's the one who wants to tell the world your secret. Yes, yes, I'll destroy him! <laughs> yeah! Beautiful move by Super Strikers! <laughs> What cost, Brenda? Now, how complicated was it to take 
this physical flat 2D concept and then put it up onto a screen where you can get away with blocks of, of, of storyboard where suddenly you have to do 25 frames a second for, for YouTube, for television. Well, we thought it would be kind of a piece of cake because we knew absolutely nothing about it. And uh, I just love the way so many entrepreneurs <laughs> go, we had this great idea, we had no clue. <laughs> so we went in and boy was it hard, yeah. Exactly, and, and so we started with local production teams. We found that we were very good at the creative ideas, at designing the characters. The, at, story, the storyboards. And writing, exactly, all the pre-production we could do. And then when it came to the actual animation, we, there just weren't enough animators with any experience whatsoever in South Africa. And so we started to travel around the world to try and find a service provider. You know, we needed labor, basically. And we went to, we went to Canada, we went to India, we went to Malaysia and the Philippines. And, uh, and we thought, we had a meeting, all of us, and we decided, let's go with the Canadians because they speak English and they're pretty close to America, they should know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it, halfway into episode one, we decided, okay, we've got, to, we've got to find a new partner. And we basically flushed the money down the toilet that we'd spent with them. How much did you spend? Well, it's about a million rand to make half an hour of, of our product. So it's big. You know, it hurts for little guys yeah. in a garage in Cape Town. Um, and uh, we went to Malaysia uh, with the creative director who had never creatively directed an animation ever before. And we, we decided Malaysia looked better from a price point of view. And we, we found two service providers. And we had a meeting in the hotel room and everyone said, OK, let's have a vote. And we voted for service provider A, we said to the creative director, hey, you sort it out, hang around, we've got to go and sell some sponsorships, you know, and sign the contracts. And, and anyway, he came back four days later and told us he'd gone with service provider <laughs> <laughs> Was it the right call? It was absolutely the right oh, call. Okay. We've got a great team, and now, so we've already completed 39 episodes. They've been broadcast uh, most aggressively by Disney, who've acquired us for the whole of Latin America, Africa, Middle East, Bits of Europe, so French-speaking Europe, Italian-speaking Europe, Serbia, Greece, uh, and the whole of Southeast Asia. South Asia, with, we're with Nickelodeon. But, but then how do these stories translate? Because you've created superheroes for a South African environment to inspire young South Africans in a South African context. And it's been broadcast everywhere. Yeah, so as we, we started to, to grow our print, into different parts of the world. In 2006, uh, we had already got into a lot of Africa and we had understood that we had to massage our product a little bit for each country. 2006, we went to Latin America and in uh, over three years, we opened about five countries up there, most of Central America, Colombia and, and, and Brazil. And, and we started to realize that actually, we had a cool story. The and themes we had are universal, cool, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, we were very unconfident of that going into those markets. We thought we we're going to have to change everything. And, and so what we ended up doing was just kind of internationalizing the team a bit more. So we brought in some players. We brought in a Latin American guy who could be from Spain, but he could be from Brazil. We brought in an Asian character called Twisting Tiger, you know, and, and he was good to, to keep Asia happy. We brought in Klaus, the German, and uh, Block from the Eastern Bloc. <laughs> He's a great defender. Not, not subtle, yes. <laughs> no, no, no that, we don't do that well. So, and so over, over the kind of 10 years uh, up to that point, we had kind of internationalized this team so that it looked very much like an EPL team, like 50 like to 60% African. The and United then, Colors of Benetton football team. Exactly, yeah. with a good solid base of African talent. And, uh, and, and so it to started to translate well. And then, you know, it's the case of dubbing with animation, which is the beauty of it. That, that's the one side of it is dubbing, of course, which mm. is, I'm sure, fairly easy and quite, it's not complicated in the animation context. Sure. But now you've got sponsors, and sponsors are on the shirts. Yeah. Um, so Caltex was the uh, sponsor originally. We see the other sponsors that have evolved into the story as well. Now, you've got to look at international sponsors, or yeah. do you then localize the sponsorships too? So we, 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 would lo we love international sponsors, um, and at the moment we don't have multi-market sponsors for the show. So it means that we are rebranding the uniform in, for different regions and different countries. So if you turn on ETV on a Wednesday at 4 p.m., you'll see Super Strikers with KFC branding. If you're in Israel and you turn on Zoom, um, it's on many times a day in Israel, you will see it unbranded. Um, if you were to go back in time 
two years ago and watch it in Singapore, you'd see it with Caltex branding. So and that's, that's how a small company in Africa has been able to make a show that competes and beats the ratings of, of some of the best American shows because the sponsors have, have, have allowed us to have a proper budget when we've built this thing. We haven't done it on a shoestring, so it's top quality and it's really... But, but, and, and massively flexible and massively adaptable, which is part of yeah. the genius of it, because it suddenly becomes a, an international... I hope, I hope you don't offend it by the word, but as a commodity. You can commoditize the storylines. Well, that's it, and that's where our scalability comes from, from our licensing and merchandising program, because it's very hard... Our broadcast sales are nice, but they might get us 40 or 50% of the way to covering the cost. Mm. Um, and then our sponsors take us all the way and, and a little bit over so we can have a Christmas party at the end of the year. <laughs> Everyone's um, going to have a Christmas party. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, otherwise, they don't come in January. <laughs> and, uh, and then what, what licensing and merchandising allows us to do is, is have this mass scalability. And what we want is everyone to have a pair of Super Strikers underpants and no, a but, but that's, I mean, we've seen the Disney example. I mean, every yeah. Disney that can be that comes out, the characters come out, the cars come out, the toys come out, the posters, the T-shirts, all of that sort of stuff. How successfully then are you merchandising? Because when we saw the, the local production, the, the, the very sad mm. local production of Jock, for yeah. example, which was animated in Craig Hall Park and yeah. the, the full of promise, mm. but ended up not being quite exactly. Disney, and we've been spoiled by Disney. Absolutely. Um, so now you've got to mimic Disney without being Disney in, yeah. in, in emerging markets. So we don't know how to do it, but we're trying. Well, <laughs> so far you managed okay with having absolutely no clue about anything, so you've done okay. We, we cruise around with a lot of paranoia, and we think yeah. that everyone else knows more than us, but we're slowly finding out that actually nobody has any idea. So, <laughs> so everyone does it like this. But we, we, we chose, because we're quite strong, strangely, in Israel, and because it's a nice small country but it's also we can make a mistake there and it doesn't spread to the yeah. rest of the world and uh, and if you go to Israel today you can buy the underpants you can buy the linen you can get the breakfast cereal that's made by Unilever you can get the back to school stationery you can get the card game and the, the monopoly version of it and it's it's all out there and it's uh, it's it's pretty cool and it's pretty exciting um, when does that stuff come here so you can buy some underpants at Jet in December. I'm in. <laughs> do, they, so, do they make our size? I think, I think if, you're a, if you're an 8 to 14 year old boy, you're in luck. But okay. you, you might struggle. Get a couple <laughs> of pairs. Stitch, stitch three together. I'm sure it'll be absolutely fine. Richard Morgan Grenville, thanks so much for coming and telling the most amazing story about Super Strikers, the evolution of uh, Super Strikers from the year, of course, 2000, when it was born and evolving into a global footballing phenomenon. The Managing Director of Striker Entertainment, Richard Morgan Grenville, on tonight with me, Bruce Whitfield. Thank you so much for watching. There'll be more tonight, tomorrow. Till then, good night and goodbye.